So for those of you that don't know much about the Koala Action Group, um, our group was founded uh, back in 1987 by uh, uh, Helen Murray and a group of residents that lived in Thornside who were obviously concerned about the, the future of the koalas. And Helen then went on to serve in council for I think it was 18 years um, and now she's happily retired, still living at, at Thornside. So, um, and as you'll see, the, the title to this, um, my presentation, is The Koala, an Inconvenient Asset. And yeah, I'll, I'll go on to talk about why I've, I've sort of named it that. So the Koala Action Group um, mission statement is to secure the future for koalas in the Redlands. And, We've been trying to do that for the last 20, 23 odd years, um, or 25 odd years, and that's our key sort of um, areas that we cover is revegetation, education, and legislation. So revegetation, um, most parks and conservation areas and uh, waterway easements that you would see around the Redlands um, generally has got trees in it that have been um, in the early days grown by members of the Koala Action Group and planted up by our, um, our team of volunteers that are very dedicated and um, turn up once a month on a Sunday for I think it's about seven or eight months of the year and, um, and plant these these corridor, or well, they're to strengthen the corridors. We plant koala habitat, but we also plant other species as well um, to try and replicate what once upon a time would have been there. So, and we know from sightings in our plantings that the, um, the koalas are using these trees, which is very re rewarding for our volunteers. So legislation, um, we spend many, many hours, you know, over the, the years, yeah, weaving our way through and reading reports and legislation and doing submissions and I would like to say that it, um, it has made a difference and in some cases I think we, we may have ended up with better outcomes uh, with some of these policies um, but sometimes we do often feel like we're just repeating the same, same old, same old um, which can be quite disheartening especially when we're all volunteers. Um, but it's something that if you don't have a say in these things, then you, at the end of the day, you, you can't sort of say, well, um, you know, we tried, we, we, we had our say. Um, so, yeah, and we, we do have little wins on occasion. So education is obviously community members, um, school groups, our, our future generations who all seem to get it. They're, they're pretty switched on, the, the children and decision makers, which is, you know, we try and form relationships with um, politicians and, you know, most of the time uh, we can find our, our um, points of, points of um, agreement and often obviously points of, of um, disagreement, but I figure that you're better off being on trying to work relationships with politicians rather than sort of burning your bridges. So, and also part of our education is our annual Koala Countathon, um, which is, it's not so much to count koalas because we know that there's there's not as many koalas out here that will have in the in the um, area these you know as, as what there used to be, but it's a good opportunity to um, contact have contact with the community and um, sort of educate them I suppose. And we hear lots of anecdotes about local you know their local koalas because everyone generally has a name for their local koala if they're in their parks or their schools. Um, and obviously we do displays as well. Um, yeah, and that's our tree planting trailer, so. And we all know the key threats to koalas. Um, I, I don't think I have to tell you is obviously habitat loss, um, disease, which comes in the form of cystitis um, and conjunctivitis. And dogs, that's actually my, my dog Gus, um, who sleeps inside with us every night and um, yeah, I've, you know, he's a, he's a well-trained dog so, you know, Coil Action Group, we're not against, you know, pet ownership but we obviously, um, yeah, we like to educate about responsible pet ownership and obviously vehicle strikes um, in the Redlands in the past has been a, a big problem and um, it's still ongoing for the small number of koalas that we, we still have in, living in the Redlands.
So just recently, uh, Coil Action Group stepped into a scientific platform, I suppose you'd say. For many, many years, we've been hearing from um, decision makers that show me the science. We, we need to see the science. You know, it's, it's lovely that Coil Action Group thinks that, you know, koalas are in trouble, but we need to see the science. So CAG um, embarked on a, a, um, a GPS tracking project and this was prompted by the Tomb to Harbour proposal, which all of you in the room, I'm sure, know about that. Um, and obviously, that development, you know, we've, we've had people say to us that no trees are going to be removed for that development, but it's, it's bigger than that. We, we know, you know, it, it, and it's, we're not just about koalas. We, we fully understand the other animals that will be impacted by that development. However, the koalas will absolutely, that will be the end of the, that population down there because of the increased traffic and um, because we now know from our tracking project where they're crossing the roads and what trees they're using. And the two narrow roads, anyone that's familiar with Tunda Harbour down there, the two narrow roads, they will have to be widened eventually to cope with the amount of, you know, tens of thousands of cars that will have to go along those roads. So, and those, um, Shore Street East, it's lined with massive koala habitat trees that the koalas are, are in regularly. So uh, you cannot tell me that those trees will eventually need to be removed. So, so the, the project basically, we fitted eight koalas. I, I won't go into detail about it, but if you, anyone wants to know more detail, it's all on our website. Um, and we do have some maps, um, tracking maps over there in hard copy that anyone's welcome to have a look at. Um, so that we fitted eight koalas with um, GPS collars and we basically tracked them for around 12 months um, and learnt, learnt a lot about not just their movement patterns and what habitat they were using but also their, um, their behaviours that actually these koalas all had quite um, unique personalities, different personalities from nervous to kind of easy going and it was, um, yeah, all, it was a very, we learnt a lot, you know, as Koala Action Group, been around forever, we thought, oh, we know about koalas, but we, we learned a lot. And when you're out in the field, that's Ken and I down the bottom there, we, we spent, I'm not sure how many days, but, you know, it, it was over a year, so uh, we, we would have spent, no doubt, probably 150, 200 days in the field um, learning about these animals. So it was, um, it was, yeah, quite a learning experience. So I just did a brief summary. I mean, we, we've got a year's worth of data on these animals, but I, I tried to sort of summarise um, what we learnt about the koalas. And the when we first embarked on this tracking project, we thought, boy, we're going to be flat out finding. We talked about doing uh, collaring six koalas. We said, wow, are we going to be able to find six koalas? Because the um, the report of the ecological report on tuna, I think they. I think they found two, one or two koalas, and we sort of thought, oh boy, it's going to be a challenge. Well, we sort of had a pick of quite a quite a number of koalas, and we ended up with eight koalas in the um, in the project. So, but during our tracking, our field work that we did, we saw at least a dozen who, including our eight, that would move in and out of the area. Um, but of course, the only ones we sort of knew where they were moving was the the ones that had the collars on. So that's an example of the um, you know the I'll show you. So this is Shore Street East, for those of you not familiar. Um, that's the Trade College um, and Redland Water and the Stratty Ferry. So GJ Walter Park is through there and Stratty Ferry is, leaves from down here. So as you can see, these koalas, this is just one koala. This is Tyler. He was the alpha male um, that we, we tracked. He was the first one we actually caught, which was um, a bonus. And he's a pretty crazy guy, Tyler. So, but he moved all the way across this entire landscape, and this is sort of this is the Tunda Harbour area there. So, so his home range, mind you, since then he's actually moved out of that area, but he still comes across um, into into this GJ Walter Park here. So. Um, yeah, so Tyler was a, well, being a male, he was very active, um, cruising around, checking out all the girls, because uh, we had five girls and three males in the project, two young males and, and Tyler. So it was um, very interesting, and 
I think one of the most interesting things was this a massive big blue gum tree that's in a private property in Shore Street East and that we named the family tree because every time we go there and a lot of you probably know the tree I'm speaking of and that's also the tree that someone was mentioning the tourists, the bus loads of, or the car loads of tourists would pull up. That's the family tree that they would pull up and because we, we came across them in our, in our travels as well. And you're not guaranteed of seeing a collar in it, but you're pretty, you're pretty um, likely to see a collar in there most days. And the little buggers are hard to see, so often you'll go, no, no koalas in there, and then someone else will come along and go, yeah, no, there actually is, because um, it's, it's a big tree. So, um, but it was, yeah, very interesting. And the other thing that we was very unexpected, Redlands uh, traditionally has high disease in our koalas, and we thought, when they, they'd go for a health check, so when they were captured uh, to get the collars put on, they'd go for a health check, and we expected them to be diseased, most of them, and they actually weren't. Uh, one female had reproductive disease, and one of the little boys had a little bit of conjunctivitis in his eyes that was treated. Um, but four of the five tracked females successfully raised joeys, um, and yeah, so it was sort of it was surprising in a positive sense for us, I suppose, which was nice. So impacts, if this development goes ahead, um, obviously I've, I've mentioned the in, increase in traffic um, during the construction phase and then adding in 10,000 additional residents to that small area. It, I mean, I don't know how humans are going to survive it, let alone the animals, to be honest. It's, um, it's going to be crazy. So, and as I said, Middle and Shore Street East, they're the only access roads into that development area, um, and they, they will have to be widened eventually. So, in the corridor running from the north to the south and the western corridor, it'll, it'll be impacted. So, it won't be just the tuna koalas, it'll be, so, again, here we are, that's tuna harbour there. So, the, the koalas actually move right up to Cleveland Point. They, travel along linear, linear Park, and this isn't the tuna car, this is other koalas as well, and they travel along that uh, Ross Creek corridor, and they also travel all the way up and down here, up to um, Henry Ziegenfuse Park, and, and all through there, Nandibi Park. So all those roads that will be basically, that's their corridor, it will be severed by the, the increase in traffic. And I think that was shown recently on a, um, the Channel 9 report that was done, they, they showed the, the devastating impacts of that increased traffic. So I'm going to step back in time now. Um, so humans have been basically, well, I'll just say we've been giving koalas a hard time for 100 years now, and I, I just decided to sort of briefly step back in time um, to when we used to um, kill koalas for their, their pelts. And it's incredible, really, that they're actually still here. When you look at the figures um, that, that we, you know, were taken out of Australia, it's hard to imagine that many koalas actually lived in Australia, uh, were here. But they, yeah, we, we certainly assaulted them in, in a big way. And it's amazing that they're actually still here. I, I'm sort of, yeah, I find it incredible. And something that, that really sort of stuck with me was... Um, the Queensland government, so they, they called for an end to, to culling of koalas and then the reprieve was short-lived when they had mass unemployment and an economic depression and they declared a final open season. So does that sound familiar? Jobs, jobs, jobs. Um, so, and that final open season was only for six months um, but that resulted in another half a million plus a million possums. I was thinking, oh my goodness, we know there's lots of possums out there but um, and that's actually, this is a letter, which I know you can't read, but I included it um, because we've often been questioned about the history of koalas in the Redlands. And that's a letter dated 1927 from the Redland Bay branch of the Queensland Producers Association calling for the government to stop culling their native bears. So, yeah, so it's a handwritten, obviously, letter. Um, and it, it's on our website. You probably read it a little bit where better on our website. Um, so yeah, so it's just a little bit of history and obviously that's koala pelts on that, um, that truck with the dog standing on top. So yeah, it's, um, 
Yeah. It's sad but sort of interesting, I suppose, that koalas are still here. So, Koala Coast. Um, 1995, uh, the state government decided that they would um, declare this area Koala Coast. So, yeah, 375 square kilometres in size and, um, and it covers all of Redland City, uh, parts of Brisbane and Logan. And so we, or Redlands, makes up about 75% so of, the, of the Koala Coast. And at that, at that time, um, well before, yeah, before it was declared Koala Coast, it was, um, they thought there was about 10,000 koalas in the, the region. So in 1996, that's when the state government um, got some researchers down here and they started doing population studies and they redid those every, I think it was every four years. Um, and we can all guess what, what happened there. So when they s did their first one, they estimated between six and 8,000 koalas um, and more, more than 4,000 were actually in Redlands there. And I don't, some of you that are, were around back in those, back in, at that time of the, you know, 1906, there, there were literally koalas everywhere. So, um, so yeah, and in that period, so there was a 10 year period where um, the casualties were, were quite, you know, excruciating, the figures are just terrible. And at that time, there was no dedicated ambulance, so the volunteers used to have to um, transport these koalas, and they were taken down. I spoke to someone who was one of those volunteers back in the day. Um, they just used their own vehicle, and they take the koalas down to the um, environmental centre down at uh, Ekwapa, and then they'd be transported the next day um, over to a hospital. So. And then Daisy Hill, um, who was operated by the state government, they came on board, and then that was followed by Redlands uh, Wildlife Rescue, which is still operating today. And Daisy Hill does not operate these days, but we also have, obviously, the RSPCA. Um, they rescue koalas now as well, uh, plus a couple of others that sort of do their own, own rescues as well under various names around uh, the Queensland. So, um, and as I said, that period between 1990s and the, the early 2000s, there was more than 600 koalas being pulled out of the Redlands then. Um, so, you know, and only 20% of those were coming back. So do your figures, it, it doesn't take long for, for that, um, yeah, to take its toll. And a lot of the animals, 50% were diseased and the females, um, they generally are, are infertile when they're diseased. So if the females can't reproduce, it, yeah, it, you know, it, it doesn't take long for those numbers to, to drop. So, and as I said, only about 20% of those koalas were re successfully rehabilitated and, and brought back for release. So, and I looked, when I was putting this together, I decided to look up the population growth in Redlands just to see if there was any correlation. And, and it's, a, it's a broad, it's a very broad thing, but, but there was a, a, quite an explosion in development around that sort of time there as well. Um, and as I said, it, it saw the population grow by about 59,000 um, in that period. So obviously they just could not cope with, with what we were throwing at them in, in the way of development. So, and that's where that decline started. So, and here we are today, uh, where there's estimated to be less than a thousand in the Redlands. And when it comes to Koala Coast, we're actually not necessarily sure how many are in the Koala Coast um, today, but we certainly know that that Redlands, we're down to the, we're literally down to the hundreds, so. But on a positive note, that's all gloom and doom, I know, uh, but you, you have to paint the picture. Uh, Redland City Council, um, over the years we, we've had various policies and, and you know, one side of council we, we have very caring, compassionate people um, and over the years I've worked with many different councils and councillors, not too many mayors, I must admit, apart from Mayor Melva Hobson who served one term, um, but we've had some very good councillors um, and we've got some very good officers inside council. Two of those councillors are sitting to my left here tonight um, and 
the councillor just put out a new koala conservation action plan and I know Tyler's sitting there going, oh yeah, we've heard, heard all this before, he's having a big yawn. But um, council have decided, I suppose, that, uh, you know, that we know, no one's trying to deny that the, the numbers are low, but they've employed a, a koala-specific officer who has a research background, who CAG are working very closely with, and their five-year plan is obviously to find out more about what's happening with these remaining population on a scientific basis and obviously with and their five-year plan is obviously to find out more about what's happening with these remaining population on a scientific basis and so this little dog here is named Billy and Billy's a koala detection dog like dogs find koalas much much better than humans do we've we've done some work with these dogs and um, yeah you know they're they're much better so they sniff out their scats and the scats are um, collected by the scientists and they're analyzed and they've been doing some DNA testing on our remaining koala population to see what's going on what they've found um, is the report hasn't been released yet but it is supposed to be released that we still have reasonable genetic diversity in our koalas in the Redlands, which is pretty amazing. However, there is some inbreeding, which happens in koala populations all over the place. It's, it's not just in the Redlands, but it, there is still enough diversity there to work with. But the numbers of them are so low that we're, we're at a crossroad, big, big time at a crossroad. And what's happened is there, this is an Ormiston project that they're doing at the moment, a pilot project to where they're, um, it's called the, oh, I didn't put the name of it up, but it, it's basically they're concentrating on an area that they're going to focus um, community uh, engagement, um, reducing the koala deaths, so that, yeah, and I mean, from, a, from the Koala Action Group's perspective, you know, we, we have to support these initiatives because what's the alternative? You, turn your back, throw your hands up. So, And as I said, we've got one sector of council that's doing good work and they're genuine, passionate people. Um, so, yeah, so that's, that's the latest thing that's happening. And obviously, everyone's seen road signs around, you know, we're revisiting old, old ground that, that we've been doing. Um, but I think, you know, having these, this new research, this is the Sunshine Coast University researchers that are doing this stuff and it's, it's fairly sort of cutting edge, you know, technology, I suppose, with, um, and not just do they find out about um, the genetics, they also find out about their health status and um, all sorts of things. So uh, we're hoping to have the researchers come to our AGM at the end of July and um, they'll be able to yeah, um, sort of fill you in more. So, so yes, that's sort of one of the, the positive things happening and you know, from our perspective, we just hope it's, um, it's not too late. I can't tell you if it's too late or not, um, but we're, we're certainly at critical, critical levels at the moment. Uh, Gemma touched on the, um, the Queensland Koala Expert Panel Report and Gemma had a different quote up there from, so I'm glad it's a, a different one, but this is a very, again, it was sort of an overarching um, comment from the, the expert panel. Um, in South East Queensland, there's clear evidence of catastrophic, catastrophic declines in some koala populations. This indicates a need for urgent policy change if these declines are to be reversed and long-term persistence of the koala is to be secured. And they, as Gemma said, they had a raft of recommendations some of which the state government have accepted and some of them they've accepted in principle, isn't it, Gemma? And they're the ones we're worried about and most of those are for koala, uh, for habitat. Habitat protection, of course, it's always the, it's always the um, elephant in the room. So why is this allowed to happen and keep continuing today? Um, obviously legislation, Gemma talked about, the legislation is too weak and when Koala, when the Redlands and or Redlands Logan and Brisbane was named the Koala Coast, it obviously came with policy um, 
And I, I can just imagine almost immediately there were developers and property owners looking for loopholes in that policy. And, um, and that still continues today. Whenever we get any piece of new legislation coming through that on paper it looks pretty good, it looks pretty strong, there is always, always loopholes. And that starts, as Gemma said, that starts at the top. That starts at your federal government, um, state government, and then local government as well. And local government, our group gets frustrated. We have the local government pointing the finger at the state, and we have the state government pointing the finger at the local. And yeah, I, I, I think it's everyone's got a responsibility to, um, you know, to, yeah, to have strong policy. And in the Redlands, at the moment, we have got a new Redland City Plan that was enacted last October that has currently, at the moment, there's, there's some amendments going through um, to help with the, the habitat protection. But currently, that Redland City Plan, I would say, this is my opinion, has the least protection for koala habitat that we have ever seen. That's from, from my... Yeah, from my perspective anyway. Um, and that is quite disturbing. Um, so we've got a Redlands 2030 community plan, which I'm, I hope most of you are, are, um, are familiar with, because I think that's how your group was born. And the Redlands 2030 community plan, it's very clear on its you know, desire. That's supposed to be the people's plan, and it's very clear that the koala is important and they, people want the koala to stay as part of the Redlands environment. And I put, this, I put the tourism strategy up there because that's another disturbing part of when I was researching to do this talk tonight. If you Google, or not Google, if you search for the word koala in that tourism plan, how many times do you reckon the word koala comes up? Zero. Zero, and I, I think I'd forgotten that. I must have wanted to forget that, and I don't know, I don't know how that happened. But um, unless I was searching, I might have spelled it wrong. But yeah. yeah. Mm. So anyway, so legislation's obviously one thing. Um, pro development agendas, the leadership of the Redlands over over decades has been, I would say, pro development apart from a very small window and I still feel that developers are, are too firmly in the driver's seat. I still feel that. We have some good people in council but I still feel that the developers are in the driver's seat. In that same Redland City plan, uh, the, sorry the community plan there, they mention about population at some point we have to look at Mm. stabilizing our population we cannot just keep developing forever so you know we developers now want our Morton Bay you know they've, they've taken the farmland they have encroached on some of the bushland and now they want they want our bay and I just think at some point where does it stop does it stop at the border of Logan City because that's where we're going we're heading for the border of Logan City and all the way up to Brisbane so I think it's a an uncomfortable discussion that we need to have. And community are not also not to blame. There's a lot of community members out there that love koalas, but they're not always prepared to change their ways. Um, and I, I won't go into detail, but I think everyone knows, even when it comes to just driving at night time, keeping your dog inside, and retaining your trees in your yard, you know, where, where possible. And I think back to the slide at the very beginning, um, you know, the, the koalas being an asset. I think koalas, their value for tourism and, you know, they're a world-loved iconic animal. And here we are in the Redlands. I think they're just not valued for what they are. And as Tom said, down at Toonga Harbour there, we have tourists getting on boats going over to Stratty. And when Ken and I were out tracking, we'd have the antenna, which obviously, you know, created quite a lot of curiosity um, from tourists going over there. And we had many tourists say, was, what are you doing? And when we told them, they just said, we didn't know there were koalas over here. And some of them said, wow, I've never seen a koala in the wild, you know, before. So, so they were thrilled. They were just, but sort of shocked. They were thrilled, but they were shocked. We didn't know. 
So, and of course, the the biggie at the end is no political will. Um, that's from you know that's from a, a higher level that filters all the way down. That it's a it's a hard one to to tackle, um, but it's something if. You know, and everyone in the room here, I suppose my final message is we have got elections next year for council and state. So if you feel strongly enough about wanting koalas to be part of our Redlands environment and also the rest of the environment, because from our perspective, if we cannot protect koalas, what chance does the rest have, really, if we, if we cannot protect koalas? So, um, so my advice is you go knocking, like Gemma said, go knocking on your, your state... Um, your MP's door and ask them how they're going to get the legislation so it doesn't have massive loopholes in it, including our local government as well. Ask them what they're going to do to help protect koala habitat or advocate at a local level up to get stronger laws in place to protect um, koala habitat. So, because that's the only way we will get change. So, thank you.